Good evening everyone. I welcome you all to the second day uh, of our lecture series on Vedanta. Today's lecture is titled The Eternal Witness based on the first chapter of Panchadashi. Panchadashi is an instructionary text that presents the essence of Advaita Vedanta with clarity and precision. The author of this text, Vidyaranya, was one of the most noted post-Shankara Advaitic thinkers associated with the Vivarana school. In this lecture, Swamiji will highlight the essence of Advaita Vedanta with reference to the first chapter of Panchadashi. Welcome Swamiji. Revit Swami, Satyamayanandaji, faculty members, guests and dear students. Namaskar and good evening to all of you. And we are back here for the second lecture in this year's lecture series. Um, yesterday's lecture was Vedanta and Positive Psychology. This evening it is only Vedanta. Like uh, the past two years, one, the first lecture is a general lecture, more of a popular sort. The next two are what would be called in the language of engineering students, hardcore Vedanta. So, today and tomorrow. Vedanta, as we, most of us, uh, we are aware, is a spiritual philosophy based on the Upanishads. Advaita Vedanta, which is the particular variety of Vedanta I am going to speak about today, it has a most startling message. It can be put very simply. What does Advaita Vedanta tell us? It tells us that we are divine. You can say I already know that. So, not divine in a, uh, in a loose sense, not in the sense in the Americans say, no, we, you're cool, they say, you're, you're really cool. Uh, not in that sense, but really, you are the immortal self, you are consciousness, unchanging immortal consciousness. This is what Advaita Vedanta is telling us. And it is saying that that's what we are already. In the words of a Swami I met uh, in the Himalayas several years ago, in the middle of a class he would sometimes repeat, Tum jano ya na jano, tum mano ya na mano, tum hiram. You know it or you do not know it. You accept it or you do not accept it. You are God. Now that's a nice, that's a startling statement and nice maybe to think about. But what does it mean? What does it really mean? And how can we realize that? Advaita Vedanta tells us our main, uh, our main problem is ignorance. We do not know who we really are. We really do not know about our true nature. If we knew if we realized who we truly are, then our problems would be at an end. Yesterday I was saying how the objective of Vedanta is Atyantika Dukkha Nivritti Paramananda Prapti, is transcending all kind of miseries and attainment of ultimate bliss. And Advaita Vedanta tells us, if you know your true nature, you will be able to transcend all suffering and attain complete uh, peace and happiness. This is the promise. And it also tells us what our true nature is, that we are existence, consciousness, bliss. But how do we know that? And Advaita Vedanta, all the texts of Advaita Vedanta, they try to tell us how we can realize that. Among all these texts, one of the well-known texts is Panchadashi, a work written by Vidyaranya Muni, a great uh, Advaitic scholar and saint uh, who lived about 700 years ago in, in what is present day Karnataka in the Vijayanagar kingdom in those days. And uh, among the number of books which he wrote, the most famous probably is this Panchadashi. It's a book with 15 chapters. That's why the name Panchadashi, 15 chapters. Now, in this remarkable work, in the very first chapter, I came across these seven or eight verses at the very beginning of this chapter. And in these eight verses, what Vidyaranya Swami has done is using only reasoning, using only reasoning, he aims to demonstrate the Advaitic truth that we are existence, consciousness, bliss, that you are immortal consciousness, that you are bliss itself. He, he tries to demonstrate it through reasoning alone. He is not going to say anywhere, it is said in the scriptures, therefore you are God. He doesn't say that at all. 
he just uses a set of simple arguments. So what I will do today is we will, we will all walk along with Vidyaranya Swami. We'll walk with him in, on this journey. But we have to walk, we have to follow very closely. We have to walk right, you know, we have to be with him. If you miss a step, you might be lost. Uh, there are this series of interlinked arguments. But because this is IIT, uh, IIT Kanpur, you're used to tough stuff. You're used to lots of arguments and lots of uh, chain of reasoning. You're used to concentrate. So it, you, it should be easy for uh, all of you. I don't know if you ever read these Tintin comics. When we were kids, we used to read Tintin comics. In one of those comics, I remember, one of the characters, Captain Haddock, uh, he's there and Professor Calculus. Professor Calculus is explaining uh, the intricacies of nuclear fission. Uh, and, he's, and all the others, including Captain Haddock, the whole team is walking behind him. And Calculus is explaining how the atoms are, uh, how the nucleus is split and so on, how energy is released. Uh, matter is converted into energy and so on. At one point, he looks back and to, to Captain Haddock and says, are you following me? And Captain Haddock, with a very, with a fierce scowl, he says, of course, I'm right behind you. <laughs> so you have to follow Vidyaranya Swami, but not in that sense. <laughs> you really have to walk with him on this journey. What I will do is, I will chant the verse those verses have been put here in this handout for you. And a very simple translation by Swami Swahanandaji has been given here. So I will chant the verse uh, and explain the arguments there. And then go back to the verse and show you how the, uh, how, how, give a simple translation of the verse. So that's how we will proceed. Let's start. This is the, it starts with the third verse of uh, the first chapter of Panchadashi and ends with the 10th verse of that chapter. Shabda sparshadayo vedya vaichitrya jagare prithak tato vibhakta tat samvid aikarupyan abhidyate What has he said here? He says, look at experience. Just look at your day-to-day -day experience. We experience so many things. And the, how do we experience it? He talks about the structure of experience. We have consciousness, which I'm drawing with a yellow. He calls samvit, consciousness. It's one of the terms for consciousness used not only in Sanskrit, but also in many Indian languages, Hindi also. Samvit, awareness. Awareness. Then we have the mind. We have the body. And we have the world which we experience. So here is a pot. Here is a house. Here is an ice cream cone and what not. And as we experience each of them, what happens is, we experience a thought, and this leads to, in our minds, this leads to a thought, an impression about the thought in the mind. The mind takes, has what is called a vritti, a modification, a thought, if you will, about the thought. The thought is the vishaya, and the mind has a vritti about the thought. So, thought, akara, vritti. And, this consciousness lights up, as it were, the vritti in the mind. Vritti means a modification. Moment we see um, this house, we have another vritti in the mind, a house akara, a, a vritti of the form of the house, and this is again lit up by consciousness. And we say, I see a house. And similarly, I see a, an ice cream cone. Not only seeing, hearing sounds. When I'm speaking, this is coming through your ears and you register what I'm saying. And this, it leads to a thought in the mind. And that thought is again lit up by the same consciousness. Now, the point he's making here is, all these experiences, these are objects 
and with the help of our sense organs, we are having these experiences. The experiences are inside us. Now, all these experiences, they are different. Ice cream cone and the house and the pot, they are different objects. And the experience of the pot and the house and the ice cream cone, they are all different. How are they different? They are different because each has a different thought associated with it. And the content of that thought is the pot or the house or the ice cream cone. But here is the crucial point to grasp. Vidyaranya Swami says, the consciousness which lights up each of these thoughts is the same consciousness. It is one and the same consciousness. It's exactly like you look at me, you look at the blackboard, you look at the chair. This one, the blackboard and the chair, they are three different objects. But it is the same light which is reflected of all three objects. The objects are different. The light which illumines all these objects is the same light. In the same way, it is the same consciousness which illumines all our experiences. Experiences differ because the objects of experience are different, because the vrittis associated with each object are different. But the consciousness which illumines each of these is the same, it is not different. That's what he has said. Now look at the verse Shabda Sparsha Adaya. Sound, Shabda, Sparsha, touch, smell, taste. Rupa, that is the forms that we see. They are all different from each other. They are all different from each other. Vedyaha, the things which we know in this, in, this year, in, in this life. The objects of our experience differ from each other. But, tato vibhakta tat samvit. Two points are made here. The consciousness which illumines these objects in our experience. One, this consciousness is different from the objects. Two, the objects keep on changing and our experiences keep on changing, but the consciousness remains one in all these experiences. We can understand this right here. Here, I have a chalk and a duster and a table. Chalk is different, duster is different from a chalk, and table is different from chalk and duster. But the same light illumines all three. Not only that, the light is different from all of them. That's what he has said here. Consciousness is different from all of this and it is one and the same in all experiences. It illumines all our experiences. Awareness or consciousness, whatever you call it. That's what he has said. Samvit, tato vibhakta tat samvit. Samvit, consciousness or awareness. Tato vibhakta, different from, separated from all these experiences is the consciousness of these experiences the awareness of these experiences, just as light is different from all the objects which it illumines. Ek aika rupyat na bhidyate. This consciousness does not change. It is one and the same through all our experiences. When, as long as we are awake, time passes, very soon it will be night and we go to bed and we dream. In the dream, we have a different world. Uh, different people, different experiences. We also have a dream body. We, also, we forget that we are sleeping on the bed. In the dream, we are walking around with a body which is also imagined in the dream. So, in the dream also we have experiences. He comes to that next. Next verse. Dream experience. Tatha swapne atra vedyam tu na sthiram jagare sthiram tadbhedotastayo samvid very interesting. First of all, he says, dreams and waking, are they different or same? You see, there are some radical Advaitins, radical school of Advaita Vedanta, who will say this waking life is also a dream. They will not admit to any real ontological difference between the waking world and the dream world. Now, this is a bit difficult to swallow because our common sense approach is dream is something we imagine. It's individual, private to each of us. It happens when we are asleep, the brain generates some kind of virtual experience. We don't say that's real. If you eat uh, three laddus in a dream and you wake up and eat one more laddu, you don't say I've eaten four laddus. Yeah. You don't count the dream laddus. Why don't you count them? Because they are, they, they are that they are false. I dreamt. 
So we don't take dream and waking as equal. If you, it works, you know, um, both ways. If a dog bites you in the dream, you're safe in the, when you wake up. But if you win 100,000 rupees in a dream, you will lose it once you wake up. Uh, you, you can't find it in your bank, uh, bank account. So the dream, we normally take it as false. When we wake up, in comparison to our waking world, we take it as false. Though there are Advaitins who would reduce both to um, the same level. If you are interested in their arguments, I would refer you to uh, the Mandukya Upanishad Swami Nikhilanandaji's translation, available in our publications. There, he gives an introduction where he gives 10 arguments which we normally put forward to show why dreams are false, waking is real. We normally give these arguments. At least some of them we normally give, even arguments which you would not think of, they have generated those arguments. So there are 10 arguments and he cuts them down one by one to show that you cannot logically claim that waking and dream are different. Anyhow, kind. He does not want us to swallow that this waking world is also a dream. He says, right, the waking world and the dream world are different. How are they different? What we see in the waking world is more substantial, more permanent. When I wake up, my room is still there, uh, my uh, uh, computer and my bike and everything are still there, luckily, they have not disappeared. Of course, my assignments are still there and the exam to be taken is also still there, grades are also there. But they are all relatively stable. What I experience in the dream disappears the moment I wake up. The next time I dream it will not be there, probably not. So Vidyanya Swami agrees with us, our common sense approach. If you want to say dreams are just dreams, false, waking is substantial and real, fine, grant it. But he sticks to one point. What is that point? The same point here. Whatever you experience in dream, the variety of things that we experience in dream, they are all different from each other, but the consciousness which was illuminating our waking experience is the same consciousness which continues to illuminate our dream experiences. At this point, I usually tell the story of Janak Raja. I think I've told this once long back here, but still I'll repeat it in brief. It's uh, very, very interesting. Janak Raja, uh, emperor, uh, he was... Uh, Fast asleep, suddenly the sentry came and woke him up. Your Highness, the enemy has attacked. We must go and fight the enemy. And he said, all right, call out the army. Call out. Give me my armor and my bow, um, bow and arrow and my sword. And he went out in the head of a big army. And it was a big fight with the invading army. And unfortunately, Janak Raja's army lost the battle. He was himself wounded, captured by the enemy king and dragged before the enemy king and the enemy king said, you are of royal descent so I will not kill you but you are banished from your kingdom. Get out of this kingdom, it's mine now. And poor Janak Raja, what could he do? He staggered through his kingdom to and wherever he begged for food or water, nobody would give him anything because they were afraid of the new cruel king who would punish them if they helped Janak Raja. So finally, after a day's journey, he crossed the border and he went to the next kingdom. And there was this long line of beggars who were standing for a free handout, food. He went into that queue, waiting for his turn to be fed. He was exhausted, bleeding and tired, hungry and very depressed. When he came to the head of the queue, the person who was giving khichdi, he said, nothing is left, it's all over. And Janak Raja said, uh, he was, you know, I'm tired and sick and can't you do something for me? And the man said, oh, you seem to be of a nice family, a good family, you've fallen on hard times. Whatever little leavings are there at the bottom of the handa, the big cauldron, would you want that? Yes, give that to me. He gave a bowl, scraped it out and put it on his bowl. And as Janak Raja with shaking hands was about to take it to his lips, a kite swooped down and knocked it from his hand. It went rolling in the dust. And Janak Raja fell in the dust, crying, uh, the story goes, ha ha kar karte hue. And ha ha kar in uh, Hindi or in Sanskrit means just the opposite of what it means in English. English ha ha. And in Sanskrit it means, alas, uh, I am undone. So, at that moment he sat up on his bed 
heart beating, sweating. The sentry rushed to him and he said, Is anything the matter, sir? You shouted. Janak Raja looked around, perfectly all right, it's night time, he's sitting on the bed, sweating. Now, if we were there, we would say, Oh, it was a dream, a nightmare. But Janak Raja, being not only a king but a philosopher, he says, Ye such, ya wo such. Is this true or was that true? Is this true or was that true? Sentry doesn't understand. He goes and calls the queen. The queen comes and says, Old man, what is wrong with you? Is this true or is, was that true? Yes, such, yeah, was such. She gets alarmed. She calls the Vaidya, doctor. Doctor takes a pulse. Tell me, sir, are you feeling unwell? Is this true or was that true? Yes, such, yeah, was such. And it goes on like this. Next day, the great sage Ashtavakra has come to the, 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 this city of Mithila. And uh, he hears in the market, you know, rumor travels very fast, even before internet. So, the king has lost his mind. He keeps on saying, yes, such, yeah, was such. And then the sage said, let me visit the king. He went to the king's court and he found Janak Raja sitting uh, on, the, on his throne and surrounded by ministers and the queen and uh, soldiers and everything. And I sort of, I can imagine, you know, a file is being brought to him. Sir, please sign, yes, such, yeah, was such. No work is getting done. But Ashtavakra Muni, knowing the truth about the king's mind, he says, O king, when you were rolling in the dust, humiliated, defeated, hungry and tired, all these things, your king and uh, your kingdom and power and queen and generals, all these, were they there at that time? He says, no. None of this was there. And now, when you are sitting surrounded by your pomp and glory and power and security, that defeat, that humiliation, that struggle, pain, is any of that here now? No, that's not here now. Then Ashtavakra Muni says, To Raja na ye such na wo such. Neither this is true nor that is true. Now the king is stunned. This is an even more depressing thought. He says, then is nothing true. Then Ashtavakra says, at this time, at that time, when in the, in the midst of defeat and humiliation, all that which you dreamt, <coughs> let it be a dream, it's not true. But were you there? Did you see it or not? He says, yes, I saw it. I was there. Right now, whether this is true or false, we will see later. But right now, are you here or not? Are you experiencing this or not? He says, yes, I'm experiencing this. Then Ashtavakra Muni says, To Raja na yes na wo such, tum hi such. Neither this is true nor that is true, but you are the truth. That consciousness which witnessed the dream and the dream events, the same consciousness is witnessing the waking world and the waking events. So that what Vidyanya Swami says is the same consciousness persists through the dream and the waking states. Now you can understand the verse. Tatha. Uh, now we go into the dream state. Swapne. In the dream state. Swapne atra vedyam tu na sthiram jagare sthiram. The objects seen in the dream world are not sthiram. They are not permanent. They are insubstantial. Alright, we grant you that. We are not going to force you to say that this jagrat is also a swapna. Not, not necessary. But tad bheda Apart from all the objects you see in your waking world and in the dream world, the consciousness which was aware of them, tayoho samvit, the consciousness which was aware of the jagrat and the sapna, ekarupan abhidyate, it is one and the same consciousness. That which illumines your waking world, where you are Janak Raja in power, in this uh, glory, or that which was illumining your nightmare, where you were defeated, Consciousness is the same. That's what he is saying. So, that one consciousness is running through Jagrat and Swapna. Waking and dream. Now, it's a big point because the body which we have in waking, the body which we have in dream, the circumstances in waking, the circumstances in dream are very different. But we are consciousness apart from all of that in waking and dream. I was making this point you see, I had an interesting experience 
sometime early in January this year. I was in uh, California in Los Angeles and to put it more specifically, I was in Hollywood. And people are surprised, Swamiji, you're in Hollywood. <laughs> but we have an ashram there, but that ashram was there before Hollywood became Hollywood. So it is not our fault that we have got an ashram in Hollywood. Uh, Hollywood was just becoming Hollywood at that time. And there are, in that ashram, there are many stories of some of the top film stars of those years coming to the ashram there. And many interesting, funny stories are there. I remember one story I heard there about an Italian film actress. I forget her name, very difficult name to pronounce, long name. In those days, in 1970s, uh, she had heard about this body which is made of annamaya, annamaya kosha, body made of food. So somebody asked her once in an interview with a film, some film magazine, what is the secret of your beauty? And she said, this, it's all pasta. <laughs> the Italian food pasta. <laughs> annamaya kosha, it's a transformation of pasta. Anyway, I was in that ashram early uh, in January this year. And there was this uh, girl, Indian college girl in the first college. She and her younger sister was in school. And her father was saying, and she was saying that she has studied one course in philosophy. And her father was saying, oh, Swami, that is the problem. That having studied philosophy, does, she does not believe anything. Then uh, I was saying, I'm so happy she has studied philosophy. Now she can understand these arguments. So when I was giving her these arguments at this point, she said, Swami, if I understand you correctly, you are saying that there is an unchanging I persisting through waking and dream. That is my real self. This body waking and dream is changing, world is changing, but that one awareness is there in waking and dreaming. Is that what you are trying to say? I said, yes, you have grasped it correctly. Then Swami, you are in big trouble. Why? Because when we go into deep sleep, completely unconscious, there is no awareness. So that awareness is gone, no samvit. So your whole thesis falls flat. Now I said, imagine this girl, 21st century in Los Angeles, this young girl asking a question and the very next verse is an answer to this question. Written by Vidyarnya Swami 700 years ago in Vijayanagar Kingdom. I said, the answer to your question is given by uh, Vidyarnya Swami uh, across oceans of time and space. Hundreds of years ago, and, and 10 to 12,000 kilometers away in ancient Karnataka, medieval Karnataka. It's as if he's anticipating your question, which you're asking today, and giving you the answer in the fifth verse. What happens in deep sleep? Jagrat and Swapna, okay. What happens in deep sleep? Supto thetasya sau shupta tamo bodho bhavet smritihi. Sacha va buddha vishaya ava buddham tattadatamaha. What does he say? I'll first explain and then come to the verse. He says, let me give an example. Here is my hand. It is, you can see the light reflected from my hand. It's shining here. If I remove my hand, in this place, is the light there or not? It's there, but you can't see it shining. You require the hand to reflect the light. You require the hand to reflect the light. You require an object to reflect light. When you remove the object, the light will still be there, but you can't see it. Another example. Imagine a vehicle climbing a steep hill in the darkness. The, the headlight, the beams of the headlight are there, and in that you can see droplets of uh, rain or dust or maybe an insect flying through. If you have driven a car in the darkness, you have experienced these things. Now imagine it's a clear sky, moonless, and the vehicle comes to the top of the hill. And the two beams in the headlight, they shine out to infinity into to the sky. There is a very clear atmosphere, no fog, no rain, nothing. Now, you will not be able to see the beams of light. If there was fog or smoke or something, you can see the beams of light. Without that, you cannot see the beams of light. But are, is the light there or not? Certainly it is there. If you go out and put your hand in front, you will see. Light is there. Exactly like that, in deep sleep, what happens? The body falls asleep. The mind stops functioning. So, there is no cognizance of the world. 
no vrittis. Consciousness alone remains. Consciousness alone remains. But there is no vritti to illuminate. Experience requires consciousness plus this. Some function in the mind which is illumined by consciousness, then we have an experience. If the mind stops functioning, you the consciousness, this samvit, remains there, but experience will not be there. That is deep sleep. I remember in the Institute of Culture, Ramakrishna Mission Institute of Culture, Gold Park, uh, in Calcutta, there was a seminar on, there was a series of seminars on consciousness studies, and there were philosophers, there were scientists, there were doctors. In one of these conferences, there was a neuroscientist and some philosophers. And the neuroscientist was asked this question by a Sankhya philosopher. And the Sankhya philosopher was an American, Dr. Larson. Uh, he asked the question, Doctor, according to neuroscience, in deep sleep is there consciousness or not, according to your definition? And the doctor stood up and said, no. We define deep sleep as a state of no consciousness. The brain is still active. There are certain activities going on in the brain. But it is not conscious. There no, is no consciousness in deep sleep. Then the, the Sankhyan philosopher said, well, according to us, there is only consciousness in deep sleep. This part is not functioning, so only consciousness is there. So this is the big difference, a bridge. Uh, the, the, this uh, the bridge has yet to be built across these two uh, ideas. But we must be aware of this difference. So in deep sleep, some width is there. Only the mind is not functioning, hence we do not get experience. What is our experience? In deep sleep, I did not know anything. Everything was dark. When I wake up, I say I slept. I went to sleep, I dreamt, then I had absolutely very nice deep sleep where I did not know anything. Everything was dark and I slept happily, peacefully. I feel very refreshed and happy when I wake up. That is our experience when we wake up. When we wake up, after waking up. Both are statements. Yeah, when we wake up, we give, we give the statement. Na kinchi da vedisham. Uh -huh. Yes. Ah, which one is true? We are taking the Vedantic perspective here. But what I said was that um, this gap has, is yet to be bridged. There is this gap. And I, what I will say here is, we had a discussion on this uh, in that conference. What the scientist defines as consciousness, what the scientist defines today, our uh, consciousness studies. Basically what we study are conscious events, thought, emotion, feelings, cognitions, perceptions. These are all vrittis, illumined by consciousness. So what we define in consciousness studies as consciousness is basically this vritti plus consciousness. We do not make a distinction between conscious events and pure consciousness. There is no, con there is no concept of pure consciousness in modern consciousness studies as so far. They are beginning to explore this idea. So the, yes, it is always intentional consciousness, consciousness of a pot, consciousness of a house, consciousness of an ice cream cone. This is what is studied. So when, when they do fMRI studies, functional MRI, they try to find out the neural correlate, I am watching a piece of chalk. Now what neurons are firing in my brain, that we can track with fMRI studies. And that's an interesting science in itself. It's called the science of neural co correlation. And that reveals so many things about the functioning of the brain. But the modern scientific understanding of consciousness is practically limited to that now. They do not as far, so far admit that there is something called pure consciousness. Vedanta is talking about pure consciousness. Vedanta agrees that this thing is not there in deep sleep. But what Vedanta calls consciousness is not something that is as yet admitted by modern science. Not only... There is no proof of it, but we will see. Um, I will tell you, for example, arguments which Vidyarnya Swami sh uh, gives to show what can be proof of it. What can be proof of it. I will give you one example to show wh what can be proof of it. Now, uh, yeah. Yes. Brain and the mind are not the same. Even in brain science today, even in brain science today, I, if you, uh, we all know about uh, the level of discussion which is going on. The conventional wisdom is 
the mind is like an epiphenomenon generated by the brain. It's something generated. How is it generated by the brain? That also we are not very sure of. Modern science has not yet been able to, let alone explain it, even define. One mathematician few months ago, we were talking, about him, uh, talking to him about consciousness studies. He was very critical of consciousness studies. Why? He says, how can you call it a science when you have not even defined the problem? But it is an important problem. Consciousness perhaps is the most important uh, issue for all of us because we are first and foremost conscious beings. Everything happens in our consciousness. So, uh, just one point. I was reading a paper in a collection uh, on consciousness study. So the paper was on pure consciousness. Pure consciousness events. Now you can see in the very title of the paper, a misunderstanding. There are no pure consciousness events. What Vidyaranya Swami here is saying is, pure consciousness is one and the same through all these conscious events. The events are in the mind, are in our experience. Experiences are events. But the consciousness which illumines all of them, that's not an event. It does not begin and end. That was, that's what Vidyaranya Swami says. Now, just a quick argument. What a classical Vedantist Advaitin would say to your demand for a proof. How do you say there is pure consciousness? Because all that we experience is only conscious events. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, perceptions, that's all we experience. So apart from that, there is some pure consciousness. How do you define, how do you prove it? Well, the proof is right here in deep sleep. And uh, let me just finish this. I'll just give you, it's, it's a very subtle argument, but, but interesting. In deep sleep, the scientist or the doctor would say there is no consciousness. The Vedantist would say that there is pure consciousness. Both of them agree on one point. There are no conscious events, no experiences. The Vedantist says, because there are no experiences, we do not, exper we do not have any particular experience of it. But consciousness is there. Now, how do you, can you give any argument to prove that? Here is one argument. When we wake up, we say, I went to sleep, maybe I dreamt, then I had a deep, dreamless sleep. I slept very nicely, very deep. I didn't know anything, I was blank, and I woke up. We say, I slept like a log, we use that term. Yes. Now, if there's no consciousness at, and at that point, how did we know this? Why do we feel this? Why do we have an intuition of that? It could be that we would go to sleep and we wake up. If there's no consciousness, only we could infer from the time spent, time passed, that uh, this period I was completely unconscious. But we don't say that. We don't look at the clock and say, for two hours I was unconscious. We say, I did not know anything. It was a completely blank, I slept peacefully. That itself is an experience. It's an experience of darkness. I give a simple example. As children, in winter, you know, we have this rajai, this blanket. So we used to play, we'll, uh, we'll pull it over our heads. So there's complete darkness. If you open my eyes in that darkness, it's dark. But am I seeing or not? I am seeing, but I'm seeing darkness. There's no light. In the same way, consciousness is there in deep sleep, but there is nothing to illumine. So there is no particular conscious experience. So the proof would... Is a light example is given. Consciousness is not like material light. It's in the sense of, since material light illumines, a good example is material light. Consciousness is, pure consciousness would not be comparable to anything. And what will you use to illustrate? What will you use to illustrate? So, that's why the language of light is sometimes used. You will see often see prakasha. Uh, that word is used for consciousness sometimes. Um, for example, in the Upanishads you find a verse. Tameva bhantam anubhati sarvam, tasya bhasa sarvam idam vibhati. That shining, look at the language, shining, language of light. Everything else uh, shines. By its light, tasya bhasa, sarvam idam vibhati, everything else shines. Everything here is shining by its light. We say that this place is illumined by tube light. But it requires my consciousness to experience this whole thing. So you can think of uh, our uh, a consciousness as a light. I'll just uh, go. I'll just go ahead with this. Yeah, we'll come back to it again uh, because in the Upanishad sometimes you find light metaphor is used, but they say it is not. It is sometimes called light of lights, Jyoti Rajyoti. 
light of lights means tube light is the light for this classroom and your consciousness is the light for the tube light because you experience tube light through your consciousness. Okay. Now let us look at this verse. Supto thitasya, after deep sleep when one awakens, so shupta tamo bodho bhavet smriti. We have a feeling, a kind of memory, it's not a memory, a kind of memory that there was darkness. I knew nothing. Sacha avabuddha vishaya. Memory is always something of something previously experienced. So we must have experienced that darkness in some form. We do not say I am, I am experiencing darkness in deep sleep because mind is not functioning. If mind was functioning, then we could say I am in deep sleep. But if you say I am in deep sleep, then you are not in deep sleep actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. if, you are, if you say I am in deep sleep, you are obviously not sleeping. Sometimes children, you know, parents will tease the children, find out if they are sleeping. Uh, that uh, uh, a little boy is deep asleep. If he is really asleep, then his left leg will move. Uh, and the <laughs> child, if he moves the left leg, is not, is not sleeping actually. So we never say that we are experiencing darkness because mind is not functioning. But when we wake up, we feel we experience darkness. darkness. Tamaha means darkness. Sacha avabuddha vishaya. This memory, this intuition must be of something previously experienced. Avabuddham tat tadatamaha. Therefore, in deep sleep, there must have been some kind of experience of nothingness, of darkness. It was experienced, it, it was illumined by uh, pure consciousness, some with. Next verse makes it clear. Sabodho vishayad bhinna. That consciousness which was illumining the darkness in deep sleep. Vishayad Bhinna, it is different from the darkness in deep sleep. It's called, technically it is called Ajnana. This consciousness is different from that. But it is not different from the consciousness which was there in dream or in waking. It is the same consciousness which illumines our waking stage, same consciousness which illumines our sleep stage, same consciousness which illumines our the darkness in deep sleep. Therefore, in all three states which we experience throughout the day, it is one and the same unchanging consciousness. Our world changes. The dream world and the waking world are different. Even the body changes. Sense of time changes. Sense of events changes. And in deep sleep, there's nothing. Blankness. One Swami used to exp uh, explain this in Nishraya Shanandaji. Uh, Swami in South Africa. He used to give this example. I came by Rajdhani exp uh, Express. So he says that in Howrah station, when Rajdhani Express comes, lot of movement is there. People coming in and getting out of the train. Station master is watching. After some time, the Rajdhani Express goes away. Another train comes, maybe a good train. Not much movement is there, little shadowy, smoky. Uh, one or two persons come and go, go. And after some time, the, but the station master is watching. After some time, the good train also goes away. The platform is vacant. Station master is still watching. What is he watching? No train now, vacant. In the same way, this consciousness watches the waking state, Rajdhani Express. Watches the dream state. Uh, like a good strain. What is the sushupti, dreamless sleep, vacant platform, nothing. There's, there's absence of uh, objects to experience. Evam sthanatraye pyeka samvid tadvad dinantare. In all the, uh, three avasthas, jagrat, swapna and sushupti, it is one consciousness. Next day, same story, jagrat, swapna, sushupti, one consciousness. Tadvad dinantare. Next day also same thing. Why only next day? Next week, next month, next year, throughout our life, so many changes are taking place. One consciousness, unchanging consciousness is experiencing all of this. Next verse is so inspiring, very poetic. Masabda yuga kalpeshu gatagam meshu nekadha no deti nasta metyeka samvid esha swayam prabha. It says, months come and go, years pass by, 
life itself goes away. Body dies. New bodies come. One this comes. Yoga kalpeshu, hundreds of thousands of years. Kalpa, millions and millions of years pass by. It is one unchanging consciousness. So many bodies have come and gone. So many experiences. The beautiful saying that uh, we are, we think we are human beings in search of spiritual experience. But the truth is that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. So many such experiences come and go. Consciousness watches. Unchanging consciousness illumines, experiences it. Masa abda yuga kalpeshu gata gammeshu ane katha. You know, you heard of Carl Sagan? Uh, he was a popularizer of science, a cosmologist. Uh, Cosmos, the serial. We saw it when we were children on Doordarshan. There's a book on that also, Cosmos. In that, in one place he says, modern science has given us an awesome range of time, you know, in, in terms of billions of years since the Big Bang. I know of only one another scale of time which can rival this range. You know, and that is the ancient Hindu idea of time, of cycles of universes. So, yugas and kalpas, millions and billions of years come and go. But what about consciousness? No deti nastameti, the sun of consciousness neither rises nor sets. No deti does not rise, no, nastameti does not set. Samvid esha swayam prabha, this one consciousness self-effulgent. It does neither rises, neither rises nor sets. This is what we are. Before I go on to the next uh, part, let me just say that this, uh, this one unchanging consciousness which we are technically is called Chit. Chaitanya or Chit. Before we go on to part of the arguments, we have concluded one big part. There is one implicit argument here which Vidyanya does not bring out which I would like to place before you, before we go on to the next part. We say you are unchanging consciousness. Why did we say we are unchanging consciousness? I would say I am this body plus mind plus consciousness. Well, bodies are changing. I mean, I'm, this body has, was, a, was a little kid once, a teenager, now middle-aged, after this old, one day it will die. If you believe in many lives, you'll have many bodies. So how can I be one particular body? It's like I'm saying I am this shirt. Well, I'm not this shirt. If I take it off and put on another shirt, I'll still be the same person. So similarly, neither body nor the thoughts in the mind are part of our essential identity. Only this unchanging consciousness is what we really are. This is what it has, he has said so far. These are the arguments. Now, little diversion. I want to make a distinction between essential properties and incidental properties. Imagine boiling vegetables. You have a fire and you have got a saucepan and you have got water and put vegetables. Vegetables are boiling and are hot. Vegetables are hot. Now, the heat in the vegetables, does it belong to the vegetable? Is it intrinsic? Is it its own property or is it is it incidental? Does it come and go? The difference between intrinsic and uh, incidental will be this. I will define it in this way. Intrinsic is as long as the thing lasts, that property also will be with it. And incidental is something that is induced. It comes and goes. The thing will remain, but the property goes away. So the heat in the vegetables, is it or incidental? You'll say it's incidental because the moment you take it off, after some time, the vegetables will cool down. They were not hot earlier. They are hot now, but they will not be hot a little later. So it's incidental heat, it's borrowed, it's borrowed. Where did the heat in the vegetables come from? From the boiling water. Now if I ask you, the heat in the boiling water, does it belong to the uh, water? Is it uh, intrinsic or is it also incidental or borrowed? You say it's borrowed. Yes, it's borrowed because after some time the water will also cool down. Water will also cool down. It was cold earlier, afterwards it will be cool. Where did it get its, where did it borrow its heat from? From the hot pan, saucepan? The saucepan, does it have intrinsic heat or is it also borrowed, the heat? Borrowed. From where? From the fire beneath. So the fire heat is borrowed by the saucepan. Now, if I ask you, the heat of the fire, is it borrowed 
or is it intrinsic? The way I have defined it, it's intrinsic because the fire, as long as the fire is there, it will be hot. If you take fire to Siberia, it will still be hot. It will not be cold. As long as the fire lasts, it's going to be hot. So, the definition of an intrinsic characteristic is that as long as it lasts, that characteristic will be there with it. If it is borrowed, it will come and go. So, it is intrinsic to fire, but borrowed by the saucepan, and from the saucepan borrowed by the water, and from the water borrowed by the vegetable. Now, keeping this in mind, let's take the characteristic of existence. This is a lot of metaphysics here, existence. Suppose, suppose, there is something which has intrinsic existence and things which have borrowed existence. What would it be like? If something has a borrowed property, that property will come and go. If the property is existence, suppose, suppose, there are a lot of philosophical issues involved here, but suppose existence is a borrowed property. What will happen? The thing will go out of existence. Thing will, if it is created and destroyed, it means existence does not belong to that. In this way of thinking, you have to do a little bit of intellectual gymnastics. This chalk, does it have borrowed existence or intrinsic existence? You will say borrowed existence. Why? Because at one time this did not exist. And at another time, this will not exist. He says, Swami, if you keep on writing, after some time, this chalk will cease to exist. Which means, existence is not intrinsic to this piece of chalk. Now, the question is, if you have followed so far, if you are still behind me, that is behind with Vidyarani Swami, the question is this. Suppose something has intrinsic existence, what will it be? What will happen to it? it eternal. It will be eternal. It will have no beginning and no end. And what did we just see? No deti nastameti. It neither rises nor sets. This consciousness is neither it starts nor is it created, nor does it end, nor is it destroyed. This chit has intrinsic existence. What is this chit? This samvit. It has intrinsic existence, which means it eternal because it's eternal consciousness. It is also it has got intrinsic existence. Anything that has intrinsic existence is eternal, unchanging existence. Technically, it is called sat. Not only chit, but also sat. Sat means eternal existence, no unchanging existence. Hence, what we have got so far is you are pure consciousness, which is also pure existence, unchanging existence. Now let's go ahead. One more point. Just one more point and then we are done. Next two verses. New set of arguments is beginning here. And these are very interesting arguments. Iyam atma parananda paraprema-spadam yataha Mana bhuvam hi bhuyasam iti prematmanikshate. I'll explain later. But here the objective is to show that we ourselves are the source of our own greatest joy. We are the source of our own greatest joy. How do you show that? The arguments are like this. Just follow this chain of arguments. Very simple but startling in conclusion. If something makes you happy, you will like it. Something, someone, some relationship, some object, some job, some book, some food, whatever makes you happy, you will like it. If you like it, you will try to hold on to it, retain it. You will try to get more of it maybe. If you have got it, you will try to hold on to it. If something makes you unhappy, you will dislike it. If you dislike it, you will try to get rid of it. Okay? Happiness, liking, want to hold on to it. Unhappiness, dislike, want to get rid of it. Now, many things in this life which we like, which gives us happiness, maybe your latest uh, mobile phone, it gives you happiness. You like it, you buy it. Happiness, liking, getting it. 
are holding on to it. When a new phone comes out, which it will, guaranteed, anything else in the world will happen or not, a new phone will come out. Once it comes out, it will also make you feel a slightly bad about the old phone. Now what made you happy at one time does not make you happy anymore. Because it makes you unhappy, unhappy, dislike. Dislike, try to get rid of it. If you get rid of it, Apple will make a lot of money. That's how it works. Now, this is the logic. What makes me happy, I like it, I try to retain it. If it at one time it makes me unhappy, I dislike it, I try to get rid of it. It may be an object, uh, it may be a job, it may be anything in the world. Maybe a person, maybe a relationship, anything. Now, keeping this in mind, let's look at the verse. He says, there is one thing in the world which nobody wants to get rid of, ever. What is that? Oneself, myself. I, myself, I never want to get rid of myself. You will immediately say, I can see the hands coming up. What about suicide? Remember, when one commits suicide as if uh, I want to destroy myself. But there always a cause is some problem in the world. Maybe the ice cream was bad or... <laughs> Or more seriously, I can't play, pay off the mortgage on this house. Yes, I saw, that was remarkable. If you have to see it, in the United States, I saw these people, minus 16 outside, homeless, standing with a sign. People who have been thrown out of their houses because they can't pay the mortgage. There's a sign, you contribute a few dollars. Problem. So, either with the world, or with my body, something is wrong, sick, suffering, tired, uh, pain is there. I don't want to live anymore. Or with the mind, depression, uh, some serious problem is there. The moment you correct this problem, you pay off the mortgage, I, I don't want to commit suicide anymore. <laughs> yes, you cure the illness, okay, I will live. Or cure the mental trouble, you cure the anxiety, whatever is there in the mind, I don't want to. Uh, you have not passed the exam, going to commit suicide. Oh, uh, results have come, you have passed with flying colors. Go on, commit suicide. No, 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 no way. <laughs> uh, so, one, in a natural course of events, one never wants to get rid of oneself. One never wants to get rid of oneself. If I never want to get rid of uh, myself, it means I always like myself. I always want to hold on to myself. I always like myself. If I always like myself, then I am always a source of joy to myself. Happiness, liking, holding on to something. If I am holding on to something always, it must be something that I like always. If I like something always, it must be something that is giving me happiness always. So the self, I, is something that I never want to get rid of. Therefore, it must be something that I always like. Therefore, it must be something that always gives me happiness. This is the logic. Yeah. Sir, what about Martin? Yeah, sure. Now, there they felt one of the two. One is, many of them had a strong belief in the immortality, this, this chit and sat, that I, this body is nothing. I can give it up for the motherland or for some high cause. It's nothing to me. I, I exist. What is this body to me? That could be one, one way. Some of them were not religious or spiritual in that sense. Bhagat Singh, he, he did not say, because I am the Atman, therefore I will give up the body. Just because I love my country. There you see, he, his eye is concerned with the whole country, with the nation. That continues. He does not uh, identify himself only with this particular body. Hmm. I am willing to give up this body for the sake of this entire nation. So there again, what is the sense of I? Where is this I located? Yeah. You see, that's why we don't want to give up the body so easily, because our I is firmly located in the body. That's why an intellectual is so, fights so fiercely for his ideas, because his I is located with the ideas. But what Vedanta tells you is, your I is the consciousness which illumines both this mind and the body and the world outside. Okay. So, I never want to destroy myself, therefore by this logic I must be a source of permanent unchanging happiness. Now look at the verse, Yam Atma Parananda, this Atma, this I, the Self is 
ultimate happiness. Why? Paraprema-spadam yataha. Because it is the source of greatest love. How do you know that? Mana bhuvam hi bhuyasam. Nobody ever thinks that let me not be. Everybody thinks let me exist. Iti prematmani ikshate. It shows the love for the self within. One wants to exist. All problems come when the self is misidentified as body or as the mind. All right. Now this has proved that I am the source of permanent joy for myself. Now how about proving that I am the source of greatest joy for myself? Next argument. And that's the last one. Tat prematmatham anyatra naivam anyatham atmanah atas tat paramam tena param anandat atmanah To explain this, let me give you an example. The mother loves her child and she loves the toy which the child loves. Okay, the mother loves the child and she also loves the toy which the, which the child loves. Now, what does she love more? The child. Why does she love the toy? For the sake of the child. So, the rule which we can sort of generate here is that if something is loved for the sake of another thing, which is loved for its own sake, then this will be loved less, that will be loved more. That for which you love something is loved more than this thing. If you love X for the sake of Y and Y for its own sake, or if you love X for the sake of Y, Y for the sake of Z, then X will be loved less, Y will be loved more, Z will be loved most. Okay? Now, he says here, everything is loved for oneself. One self is not loved for anything else. It may sound selfish, but he's not being selfish here. Even the greatest social worker, even a martyr who's sacrificing himself for or herself for the uh, country or for the welfare of humanity. Why does he or she do that? Because she dislikes it. No, I like doing this. It makes me happy. So it's done for the happiness of the self. Only that person's happiness, a social uh, worker or a uh, person who loves humanity or the country is more enlightened in his or her choice of happiness. A person who loves ice cream or uh, gadgets is little less enlightened in the choice of happiness, where would things which make him, him or her happy. But again, it's always done for the self within. So the argument here is, whatever we love, we love for the sake of the self, even social work. It's loved because it makes me happy to, to work for others. So whatever is done, yesterday we saw Swami, the best example, Swami Vivekananda was asked, why did you become a monk? What did he say? For your sake? No. Because I like it. Because I like it. That's the most honest answer. I may be working for your sake, but that gives me joy. That gives me joy. So everything is loved for the sake of this self. The self is never loved for the sake of anything else. Now if you look at our ranking system, you will find in that case, the greatest love is for the self. The greatest love is for the self. That which gives us greatest happiness most. So, the conclusion here would be, not only that the self gives us permanent happiness, it also gives us maximum happiness. We never think of it that way. You see, our calculus of happiness stops at just outside I. It's as if the things which we can see are there up to the spectacles we can see. But that which is seeing we cannot see, the eyes themselves. So everything is done for the self, we stop at the last point just before the self. And we say these are the things which give me happiness. They give happiness to the self which gives maximum happiness to me. I myself am my, at the source of my greatest happiness. I myself am the source of permanent happiness. This is the conclusion of these two verses. Tat prematmartham anyatra naivam anyartham atmanah. For the, for the sake of the self, everything else is loved. The, the self is not loved for any other sake. Understand it properly. It's not asking you to be selfish. Ata tat paramam. Therefore, it is the highest love. That is uh, a love for the self. Therefore, the self is the source of highest happiness because we love it the most. The last verse is just a conclusion. 
What does it say? Itham satchit parananda Atma yuktya tathavidham Param brahma tayosh chaikyam Shutyante shupadishyate Hence, this joy which we find, it is called ananda. And this sat and this chit. What we found through the series of arguments is that I am that unchanging consciousness chit which has intrinsic existence, sat and which is ultimate bliss or ananda. How did we find it? By a series of arguments. Yuktya tathavidam. By arguments alone, by reasoning alone, by vichara alone. Now he says, open the book, Upanishad, open the book, Shruti Anteshu. Shruti Anta, Shruti means Veda, Shruti Anta Vedanta, Vedanta means Upanishad. Open the Upanishad, what does the Upanishad tell you? Param Brahma Tayosh Chaikyam. In the Upanishad, it tells you Brahman, God, the ultimate reality, Param Brahman. We will discuss this tomorrow. That Brahman is Sat Chit Ananda. A book tells you Brahman is Sat Chit Ananda. What did we find in our investigations? I am I am Sat Chit Ananda. Therefore, Brahman is I myself. I am Satchidananda. The Upanishad tells you the name of Satchidananda is Brahman. Therefore, Aham Brahmasmi. Param Brahma Tayesh Chaikyam. Param Brahma and the Atman, the ultimate reality, and you yourself are one and the same thing. That is what Vedanta tells you. Now, after doing this, I have come to the end of the arguments. Uh, and we have come to the end of time also. So, just one thing I should mention here. It, it leaves confusion in the minds of many people. The confusion is this, Swami, we heard you all and this lot of arguments and all that, but so what? I'm still the same. <laughs> this has not only to be read or heard of in a, of in a class. Now there is a rigorous course of sadhana, of practice, which will help us to make it a living reality. Earlier, what has happened? Earlier, I had ignorance about Vedanta. Now. My ignorance about Vedanta is hopefully dissipated a little bit. I know what Vedanta teaches, this kind of arguments are there. But I still don't feel that I am Satchidananda. I was just vague theoretical idea about Satchidananda. I still feel, who are you? I am this. Our instinctive reaction is, I am this body and mind. When this instinctive reaction is also gone, when I can claim with all honesty, I need not do it with a loud uh, loudspeaker but to myself i can claim with all honesty it's true i am eternal non-changing consciousness and bliss sat chit ananda then only uh, really i have got advaitic knowledge for that the four yogas are prescribed jnana yoga raja yoga bhakti yoga and karma yoga. What we are doing till now is jnana yoga. Today what we did is jnana yoga. And that's just one of the first steps in jnana yoga. Hearing the truth, thinking about the truth. Shravana and manana. And to, for it to be effective, we must be prepared by these. Karma yoga gives us purity. Uh, our, it prepares the mind for receiving these truths. Bhakti Yoga gives us devotion to God. And Raja Yoga concentrates the mind. With this devoted, pure and concentrated mind, when we go through this vichara exercise, the idea is this truth which we are talking about will become a living reality. Then with Shankaracharya we can say with all conviction, Chidananda Rupaha Shivoham Shivoham. We can actually feel that. It becomes a living reality, becomes practical in life, it will help us in life. Without these preparations, without these sadhanas, what will happen is, it will be something I heard in a lecture, that's all. It will be something I read in a book called Panchadashi. It did not make any difference in my life. 
that difference will be made only by the preliminary sadhanas. Preliminary is uh, a misleading word. It's a lifelong sadhana. So I just mentioned this because a number of cases I have seen in the question answer session which follows afterwards, one question inevitably will be this. Well, so what? Nothing happened. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll conclude here and take questions. A few quick, quick questions. Okay. So many questions are there. We'll go this way. So you were asking, you already asked one, so we'll go this way. Yeah. Deep sleep? Uh, is it analogous to uh, the death? Because, uh, Deep because sleep in because some... Because consciousness, as you said, consciousness is a parambar, such as that. Yes. Okay. So, one thing like, that, that came in my mind, uh, like, consciousness is seen for all living people. Yes. Purpose. Yes. And uh, it is not like, uh, for you it is different as for me it is different. It is one consciousness. After the death of the, in death is just destruction of this body. Ah, According to Vedanta, this subtle body called Sukshma Sharira, it transmigrates into another body. So our memories, our tendencies are all stored here. So we go into another body. That's the idea of Punarjan, one new body comes along. But the consciousness is one and the same. And in deep sleep, uh, like, uh, there is like ignorance, like, uh, 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 Yes, Ajnana. So, Yes, so that's why sleep is called a little death sometimes. Sometimes sleep is called a little death. So in, after death, there may be a phase which will be like deep sleep. Yeah. Okay, question. Uh, sir, my question is in the first two verses which we discussed. Uh, like in dream state and in real state, awakened state. Yeah. When we are awake in the awakened state, we know that we had a dream. Yes. And not the other way up. Yes. So what's the reason we say? Yes. So the reason is... Um, the awakened state provides the materials for the dream state. When you wake up from the dream state, what do you feel? Oh, I was dreaming till now. Now I am awake. So the awakened state is the basis for the dream state. What Advaita Vedanta tells you is, for all these three states, Jagrat, Swapna, Sushupti, there is this samvit which is the basis for all three. Because of it, all these three states are coming and going. And by it alone, all three states are illumined. From the point of view of some with, all three states are one and the same. And one and the same means they are, there is no difference that, that one is more real and the other one is more real. But compared to the waking state, the dream state is, uh, is secondary or dependent on the, uh, on the waking state. It's out of the materials of the waking state that the dream state is built. That is one way of looking at it. That is, uh, if you are interested in uh, Advaita Vedanta, that would be the explanation given by the school called Srishti Drishti Vada. This one, I will not go into the details. There is another school called the Drishti Srishti Vada which will equate the two states, which will not agree with what you are saying. They will say that both are equally true or equally false. Okay. Yeah, there is a question there. So, uh, is the object world Ah, yes, a good question. I didn't go there. Tomorrow it will be answered, but uh, let me tell you once more. Uh, let me just mention it here. You understood the question, and it's a very good question that he has asked. In this diagram, it seems that Satchidananda is one, and this world is different. Isn't it? And that's what we have been saying. Consciousness is apart from this, apart from this, apart from this. But that's only the first stage of Advaita Vedanta. After realization, one feels not only is that it's not apart from any of this, rather it forms the background of all of this. The real diagram would be something like this. All this is in consciousness. See, there are two stages. One is where we see consciousness illumining something different from it. The philosophies of Sankhya and Yoga would agree to that. But in Advaita Vedanta, consciousness is the reality in which all these things appear. Shankaracharya says in his uh, Dakshinamurti Stotram, Vishwam Darpana Drishyamana Nagari Tulyam. He says this universe is like a city seen in a mirror. 
What is that mirror? The mirror is the mirror of your own consciousness. Now you will say that there is something outside a mirror which is reflected. The city is there which is reflected in the mirror. Here Shankaracharya says Nijantargatam. There is nothing outside. It's the consciousness itself which is appearing in all these ways. And then getting reflected in a particular mind and experiencing all of it. So according to Advaita Vedanta, the ultimate realization would be we are all one consciousness, including all these so-called bodies, minds, objective, these things. And when you realize that, it's not that everything will disappear. If you are sitting in these plastic chairs, if you ask how many chairs are there, you will say 200 chairs. If I say from the point of view of plastic, how many things are there here? Which is the only plastic. There's only plastic here in all these chairs. Now, after realizing that, will the chairs disappear? No, it will still remain as chair. Only you have realized there is a more fundamental reality behind the name and form of the chair, which unites everything into one. Okay. So, uh, so we can take consciousness as the origin of the objects? In this yes. Two points, very quick points here. Does consciousness produce these objects? One answer would be, a first preliminary answer would be, yes, consciousness is the source of these objects. But a second deeper answer would be no. These objects have never really been produced. They only appear to be different from consciousness. Would you say that the uh, plastic on the chair on which you are sitting, the plastic is the source of the chair? It's not the source of the chair. It's not that the plastic has produced a chair. It's the plastic itself appearing as the chair. There are not two things, plastic and chair. It's not like a, um, um, you know, um, a, uh, a seed producing a plant or even better example would be a factory producing a car. Car is separate and the factory is separate. Not like that. Not that consciousness produces these six. It itself appears as in, in these forms. Yes. If consciousness never rises, no sense, hmm. then why should people are born awake and this? You can answer that itself. If you look at what is here, the mind. Right? Now, it is the difference in the mind and the body which creates differences between us. Difference is not in consciousness. A question is asked, if we are, consciousness is one and constant, then why is it that in, in wake, right now we are more conscious, when we are dreaming, more conscious, less aware, in deep sleep, not aware at all. But the answer is, the difference is in the mind. In waking state, the mind is fully functional. In dream and in deep sleep, the mind becomes progressively less functional and not functional at all. So, the differences are in the, in the mind. It's like sunlight pouring through the stained glass windows of a church. Now, the glass windows have different colors. So, the, inside the church you will find sunlight in different colors, you know, red, blue, yellow. But it's the same sunlight. Because of the glass, the difference is there. Because of the mind through which consciousness travels and is working through it, so much difference is there. Yes. No. You are consciousness. There is no question of most conscious or less conscious. Only the reflection in the mind will change. When the mind does not work like in our deep sleep, there is uh, no consciousness is evident here because the mind is not working. In fact, not most conscious, less, least conscious it becomes when in deep sleep. So, in death for a while there might be a period of no experienced consciousness, blankness. But you are pure consciousness. Imagine in another way, I'll give another example. My face and a mirror. Depending on the quality of the mirror, the reflected face will vary. But that does not change my original face. The only problem is the original face I never see. What I always see is the reflected face. And that depends on the quality of the mirror. Yeah. Okay, that will be the last question. One more here, Akhilji. Uh, okay, quickly. One, uh, one question on the terminology. Like, uh, when, you, when you say consciousness, as we use in English, it's different from Sanskrit. Yes. Right? So, how should we, uh, in simple words, how to explain Sanskrit which is different from the usual consciousness that we speak in general? In English or in a more technical language, in philosophy, Western philosophy, for example, it would be better to speak of pure consciousness. Pure consciousness. Sanskrit would be equal to pure consciousness. And that's a problematic term because 
most Western philosophers and especially neuroscientists, consciousness studies, they do not talk about pure consciousness. I told you that paper I read, the title itself is contradictory. Pure consciousness events. Events are always in the mind, in our experiences. Experiences are different conscious events. Consciousness which illumines all of them is not an event. Jagrat, Swapna, Sushupti are sets of events. But all of them are illumined by consciousness, some with, which is not an event. Okay, one more question. Hmm. Yeah, at, back there. So you said uh, that uh, our consciousness is experiencing all the, uh, like uh, we are experiencing many months, years, ages, and uh, so we are witnessing from uh, our childhood, like uh, at childhood we were there, and, uh, uh, and younger, and uh, after that, this life we will be there. So why can't we realize that? Why, why can't we uh, remember what happened before this life? Yeah, this is a standard question. Why don't we remember uh, what happened in past lives? Again, you can easily give the answer. Remembering something. Remembering something. Where, is, where are memories? Not in consciousness. Memories are also in the mind. They are illumined by consciousness. If I try to remember something, I may remember it, I may not remember it. Both, both remembering and forgetting are illumined by the same consciousness. I am trying to remember a poem I learnt as a child. If I recall it, ah, I am aware of the poem which I learnt. If I can't recall it, I am aware I cannot recall it. This awareness is consciousness. But recalling and everything is in the mind only. So, that which is in the mind, it depends on whether you will be able to recall it or not. Even in this life, imagine when you are 5 years old or 2 years old or 1 year old. Just about nothing, we remember nothing from that time. What about the past life? Sister Nivedita once asked Swami Vivekananda, is it true that we can have memories of past lives? And uh, Swami Vivekananda scolded her, saying that, sufficient unto the day that evil thereof. This, this life suffering itself we cannot deal with. Now past life. <laughs> what will past life be like? Something like this only. How will it help you? Uh -huh. But in Patanjal Yoga Sutra, it's clearly said there are a set of techniques which will enable the yogi to recall past lives. They can recall. One more interesting. Uh, okay, you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, we can uh, experience our childhood like if we are a kid, uh, we can easily uh, But st uh, uh, our past lives, why can't we? Exp but in our childhood, you only think you can experience. Try to imagine when you were a baby, when you were a toddler. You can't experience. You just logically know that you must have been a toddler because you have seen <laughs> pictures and you know everybody, you see toddlers, so everybody must have been a toddler. In, so I, am, I was also a toddler. I was also a baby in arms. But the past life, we do not have memories. That's why. But memories are there and they say yogis can through certain techniques recall past lives. Uh, let me give one, one example, another slightly related example but very touching. You know this Malaysian air uh, Airlines aircraft which was shot down over Ukraine? Now, one boy, uh, one young man from Netherlands, that aircraft was flying from Netherlands to some other place, maybe Malaysia. So it was flying over Ukraine when it was shot down. Now this young man, he wrote an email to me saying that my friend was on that aircraft. You see, I've watched your videos on YouTube. You say that one consciousness watches everything. So the consciousness in me is also watching the mind and the thoughts of my friend and everybody else. So my friend, she was on that aircraft and she died. Now, is it possible for me to know her last thoughts? So very touching way she has, he has written this. And I have to say, unfortunately not because the consciousness is common, but the minds are different. Here there is one mind, here there is another mind, and different bodies, and different bodies here. Consciousness is one and the same. So that body has been destroyed. That mind has gone on to a new body. The consciousness, the understanding of that mind is in that mind. Understanding of your mind is in your mind. Both are illumined by the same consciousness. You see, this question arises, you know, it arises all the time. Because as yet, we are not able to separate mind and consciousness. So all the time, we are taking 
the mind for consciousness. But the mind and consciousness actually are different. It's like this pa page. There are two things here. What is written on the page and the light falling on this page. The light falling on this page is different from this page. So whatever information is in this page is in this page only. The light just illumines it. Another page, same light illumines it. Now you will say why that page does not have this information. The information is in the page, not in the light. Of course, can we know the contents of another mind? For that you have to go to a different discipline, not to Vedanta. Uh, yoga, they say there are techniques in, in Raja Yoga, Patanjali Yoga there are techniques they say. Okay, let's sum it up. Akhil ji, one last question. Huh. Okay, a, a very good question, a very good question. You are talking about one quite consciousness. Now, next you said this one consciousness is everywhere. In our minds we feel consciousness. All of us, we feel it right now, inside us. We feel consciousness. But what about this thing, this chalk? It's very good to say everywhere there is consciousness, but where? I presume there is consciousness in living beings. But what about non-living beings? There does not seem to be any consciousness whatsoever. Now, how do you explain that? The explanation is this. As I said, consciousness shining through a mind and a body experiences the world. Now, this consciousness shining in the mind is reflected in the mind. And that reflection is called chidabhasa. Reflection of, literally it means reflection of consciousness, shadow of consciousness or um, an appearance of consciousness. What is that? It's nothing technical. Just now we are experiencing it. The consciousness which we feel right now is not the pure consciousness. It is that pure consciousness limited in the mind. That's what we are experiencing now. And that's what we use for experiencing the world, the reflected consciousness. Now, the point is, only the mind has the ability to reflect consciousness. The body or the world outside, a stone cannot do that. It's, it's nothing very difficult, it's nothing very uh, uh, complex. It's like um, sunlight falls in the garden. It falls on the rocks, on the leaves, on the pool in the garden also. But only in the water pool you will find a little reflection of a sun is formed there. But in the rock, there is no, it's just light is reflected, but no little image of the sun is not formed. I stand here facing the wall. There is a mirror in the wall. Only in the mirror my face will be reflected, not in the rest of the wall. Both are equally inert material objects. But one material object has the capacity for reflecting an image. So something like that happens. They say that this chit consciousness is reflected only in mind. Wherever there is mind, you will find an appearance of consciousness. But, they say, consciousness is there everywhere. Only in the mind you find an appearance of consciousness, the activity of consciousness, the presence of consciousness, and the use of consciousness, which we are using for our day-to-day -day transactions. So, that's why we find consciousness within us, also in the other living beings, where nervous system has developed enough to support a mind. Thank you very much. Namaskar.